<laughs> Good evening, everybody. I've started the recording. Look at all those smiling faces. Tonight we're meeting with Danielle Tagater, who is an awesome painter, artist, friend. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Paul. Oh, I'm going to switch to the other view. Tell me, where were you raised? Where did you grow up? Where was I raised? I was raised in upstate New York about two hours north of New York City. And in, 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 you know, like three minutes, how did you get from there to here? Blue collar, up upstate New York, um, graduate school, Art Institute of Chicago, how I met you. I Where did you go to college? I went to SUNY Purchase. Where did you, what, what did you major in? I majored in painting. When did you in your life think you were gonna grow up to be a, an artist? My whole life. I mean, like so, as a little kid, when you were on a tricycle, you thought you were going to grow up to be an, art, an artist? I did. <laughs> I think that's true with a lot of people. Not everybody, you know? I mean, some people come to it later in life and have some epiphany. But, I mean, an awful lot of people, including those that are not even artists today, you know, curators, um, gallery directors, etc., thought that, you know, their introduction was, I am an artist. And, you know, a lot of them get it beat out of them or empirically other things happen. Um, that's fa How did you, uh, I don't know where to go with this. How did you decide that graduate school was a likely prospect? What was your thought process? Do you remember at all? Yeah, of course I remember. Um, oh, yes, right. You're younger than me. I forgot. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little while ago. Um, you know, I really wanted to go on to graduate school. I really wanted to continue the structure I had in school. And, um, you know, a lot of my professors actually had gone to the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, my thing is that, you know, I really wanted to get away from New York. So I went to, I moved to Chicago, as you know. And um, that was a great thing for me. I spent 10 years in Chicago. And so that was you know, a wonderful experience. Why did you leave? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from New York, first of all. My family's here. I mean, that's the main reason. Only, I'm an only child. I wanted to come back. Um, and I really felt like there was a lot. My dream my whole life was to be as hokey as this sounds, right? It's going to sound like dancing on Broadway or something. But I wanted to live in New York City and be an artist here. <laughs> okay. This sounds so amusing now. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's pretty much what you're doing, isn't it? It is what I'm doing. I mean, I guess, like, um, uh, I love my life, but definitely, like, the idea that I had when I was um, a version of, like, 1970s Soho lofts. <laughs> right. So, you know, there's definitely a reality, um, you know, but, um, I, you know, I came back. I came back for the Marie Walsh Art program, too, which was, uh, gave me a free studio in New York for a year. So that was which, a which program was that? It's called the Marie Walsh Art Foundation. And What's the second word? I don't know this. The Marie Walsh Sharp Foundation. Oh, Marie Walsh Sharp. Okay. And if people don't know about that, that's an amazing um, residency in New York that gives you a free studio. She was actually from Illinois. She was a, a lawyer from Illinois who wanted to help artists. And um, I went through a lot of residency programs when I got here. And that's what kind of helped me stay in New York. But that is a really good one in particular. Um, let's talk about the residency program. I mean, this is a process of acclimation, familiarization, <laughs> um, God, don't fall over. I can't, like... I know. Thanks. Um, and and easing easy the strain financially, too. All right. So how did you... What, what, found, what residencies did you do? How many? Talk about each. Okay. Talk about each. That will take a little while. Well, let's give it six minutes. Total. Okay. Six minutes. It's fine. Um, when I came back, um, to New York. Um, there are, and many people don't know this, but there are about 14 studio programs in New York City that give you um, at least a studio. Many of them give you more than that. Some of them give you funding. Many of them bring curators in to see you. Um, so I went through um, Smack Melon Studios. I'll just name them. and I can Say the name slowly. Okay. Smack Melon Studio. What's the first word, Mac or Smack? 
Snack. As in snack. Okay. Snack. I love this one. Okay, Snack Melon Studio. Okay. Um, that is in Brooklyn, and it gives you um, a stipend, studio space, um, curators. The Marie Walsh Sharp Foundation gives you a year-long residency. It's usually for painters. Um, a lot of museums and galleries come through there. I, that's how I did get my first show in New York. Um, there is the Henry Street Settlement, also a stipend studio space. There is the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council Studio. They have, st I had a studio on Governor's Island, but they have spaces around the city. Um, and there's many, many more. There's, uh, there's Wave Hill, which is in the Bronx, um, that gives a uh, stipend studio space. There is the Studio Museum in Harlem that gives a large stipend. Um, so I did that for about six years and um, I went from studio to studio. I applied and, you know, was rejected many times. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I applied every year and that was really how I stayed in New York. And you know, I guess looking back for me, the most important thing for that is that I was around um, really great artists who I became friendly with. And, you know, that, that helped me get into shows. So I'm starting to get questions here. Are these for New York residents only? You can ignore the questions and I screen them and I'll, you know, I'm going to ask, but I was going to ask that one. So yeah. yeah well, it's, a, it's a good question. No, it is um, definitely. And you know, some of them are, some of them are not. So for example, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, that is federal money and that is for New York residents. But for example, the Marie Walsh Sharp Foundation is not, and artists come from around the country. And I came from Chicago. So um, it really goes on an individual basis, pretty much. Um, so like I said, some of, them are not, some of them are, some of them are not. I'd say even about half, half. Um, but that was a great way um, for me in particular. I just, I, I wanted to come back here. And looking back, I probably, it would have been very difficult, I think, to survive as an artist without that kind of support. I mean, that really set a foundation for me. I'm still friends with a number of these artists. I mean, I'll say that I'm, I'm in a foundation now, and you can see behind me, I'm in my, my studio. So I'm in the Elizabeth Foundation, and this is a residency in Times Square. There are 108 artists in the building, which is pretty amazing. Um, I met Bill Carroll a few weeks ago. Yeah, so you talked to Bill. So great. So you guys know. And so this is a little bit of a diff. This is, I'm talking about the ones before our free studios, and that's a really different, you know, a different thing. So... I mean, that gives you probably about six minutes. <laughs> How much success did you have in Chicago? So wait, you were at the School of the Art Institute for two of those years and then eight years as a free spirit? Yeah, yes, I like that free spirit. So um, my Chicago story, you wanna hear my Chicago story? Um, well, I, wanna hear about, I wanna hear about how much success you had. Um, no success I mean, in Chicago, Paul. <laughs> 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 so my story in Chicago, um, I had a great loft on North Avenue when it was still North Avenue and it was, you know, it was very inexpensive and I would, it really enabled me a lot of time to paint. But I had a funny story after spending about eight years after graduate school, which was quite a long time, um, two, and this is, um, Two of my closest friends got famous the same week. <laughs> uh oh. So um, one of them got picked up by Deitch, which was yeah. a big gallery at that time, and the other one got picked up by Mary Boone in New York. And I was pretty much just painting in my loft, <laughs> yeah. going at the cafe. <laughs> and so I actually thought to myself, okay, it's time to do something different. And I, at that time, I applied to, I stopped painting, put all my paintings away for three months. And I started applying to things. And um, I talk about this because I think artists don't talk about being rejected for things. And so I applied for 76 things. And I had, and this was the time it was slides. So this was like hell. 
And I just want to paint the picture of, I would come home in Chicago, it was about 30 below zero, and I just want you to picture sleep hitting me in the face. Oh, poor thing. My mailbox, what? Poor, I'm just... <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have one rejection letter. I would have like seven. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a great experience for being an artist because it really, really hardened me. And it was, I was checking them off on my refrigerator and I got down to my last two things. And I had not gotten things that I thought had been, were going to be easy to get. And the most prestigious thing on my list was the Marie Walsh Art Foundation. And it was 10 artists and over a thousand applicants. And I got down to the two and I got a phone call and I got it. And I knew that was like my ticket back to New York. Um, when I got back to New York, my very, this by the way has never happened again, but my very first day in New York, I had a curator from the new museum I wasn't even unpacked. She came in. She was at the Sharp Foundation. She said, I'm curating a show on architecture. And she said, your work would be perfect. And that was my confirmation. So, you know, I love Chicago and I had a great time. <laughs> and it enabled me, now looking back, what, what Chicago really enabled me to do is to have a lot of time painting and, and making my work. And that was incredibly important, I think. Um, but no, I, I didn't, you know, it took a long time to have any success. It was certainly not out of graduate school. You know, and there's yeah. been a lot of peaks and valleys since then. Well, that, yeah, that's more realistic. I mean, some people get lucky and hit something, you know, shortly after, you know, in graduate school um, or in a re shortly thereafter. Um, how, how long was it until you had a relationship with a gallery? I came, you know, I'm trying to think, but my, you know, I did have a gallery, um, about a year and a half after I came back to New York, but it was many years after I had graduated with my MFA before I had my first show here. And so that it took, it took quite, quite a while. And you know, now I'm on my third gallery, so that's the other story, that's what happens. <laughs> How many galleries do you have? I have three galleries, but I've been through, you know, if you, I think, show around for over 10 years, you, you know, consistently, your galleries close, most of them close. I mean, that's the name of the game is galleries close. And so, um, you know, this will, I, you know, I'm on my third gallery here not for any bad reason just because people move and things close and things change i think having three galleries is kind of like the minimum and i think that you know having more can be i mean like todd chilton who i think is a wonderful artist was show had a fabulous relationship with hudson at feature mm -hmm. and to have an artist of that a dealer of that caliber up and die on you is you know i mean it's traumatic to the whole art world it's certainly traumatic to the artists that he represented and okay. and you know and the, when the galleries close how much warning did they give you it's not like they called you up a year later and said we're thinking about leaving right they it's it's like a month no, i mean you know those of us who've been around and got kind of know <laughs> first of all things start going wrong in galleries and i think the number one thing that starts <laughs> to happen is people and you know this, just stop paying you, or you start hearing that. And I start taking my work back. <laughs> because, you know, definitely, um, you know, things shift. And I think you're right, galleries in general uh, don't give a lot, of, a lot of warning. You know, and I think you're exactly right. Three galleries minimum, absolutely. I mean, I, I also show in museums and other places. Um, but I think that it's constant, they're constantly shifting and changing and closing. I mean, absolutely. You talk about the 10 year period you were in Chicago and could develop your art and your aesthetic to a greater extent. Does have a gallery make that more difficult or easier or does it impact on what you make? You know, there was a period of time where I just spent years creating my work. And, um, and then, you know, I, I had the show. I, I, I think that only happens 
very few times in your life as a professional artist. I mean, in general now, I am making my work. Hopefully it's going out to exhibitions. Many times I'm working towards a show and towards a deadline. Um, in general, I'm working towards deadlines. So, you know, for me, I, I work uh, well on deadlines. So that's... Yeah, but that wasn't really the question. I mean, I'm t I can think of an artist who I, both you and I know who shows with a major gallery in New York who feels like he has to be successful or the gallery will dump him. He doesn't have... He cannot have one bad show. Therefore, he has to keep incrementally modifying the work that he's been doing and not make any real changes. And he kind of bemoans his success because he and wishes I, he had more room that's to... That's probably to, about half the artists that I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so well, yeah, but I want to hear from your experience. My experience. My experience is I lived on my work for a number of years in New York City, and I definitely got a taste of that. You know, when you are, when you are starving to pay, pay your rent and you sell a yellow painting, it starts to be, oh, you know, maybe I should make another yellow painting. It, it's hard not to go towards that road. So for me, um, I'm an academic. I teach um, at the City University of New York. Um, I got tenure, so I, I do, and I have always taught. So, and I feel like I, I got very lucky. I, I joke that I got the last tenured painting job in New York City, right? Um, and I feel very lucky, though I worked very, very hard to get that. I taught in a lot of different schools and adjuncted, and <laughs> commuted. Um, but for me, what that enables me is that, you know, I've had off now for three months and I have a base salary. And that's, um, that's an amazing thing, you know, because it enables me to, to develop my work and not only think about selling my work. Although, um, in New York, things are so expensive, you can't really live on an academic salary. So in order to like sustain a studio, I still do have to sell work. So there still is that, that pressure. But you feel clear, uh, what I hear you saying, and this is interesting to me, is that you feel like you are a better artist or you, can, you, you have more freedom and liberty as an artist because you teach? I, I do. I mean, I feel very, very lucky. And I feel that when I come into my studio and I'm, a, you know, I'm about to start a new body of work now. So I just had a bunch of work that is left. And I feel like, you know, I can like take chances in my work. I don't have to make what I just made, you know, two months ago you know, in a sense. I don't well, have a lot, to a lot of artists feel the other way though, that I think teaching takes so much time and energy and psychic mental energy right. that they can't focus on their artwork and they're compromised and they're constrained and can't deal with their career. You feel like teaching has been great for you. Well, I can't think of a job that I would go to two days a week and then enable, I have five months off a year. That's an amazing thing. Now, you know, first of all, you have to think, what kind of person are you? I love people. I love talking. Um, teaching's always been great for me in that way. I, I really enjoy it. If you were making a quarter of a million dollars a year, you'd probably still be teaching. I probably would. Okay. I, I really think I would. So I do know a lot of people burned out, and I think the road of the adjunct is hugely problematic. And Agreed. I feel like you know, after you do that for two to five years and then you stop that or use it as a step because that's where I think people can really be taken advantage of. And I think we need to define that for a moment, though. An adjunct uh, instructor is someone who does not get any of the benefits of being full-time right. faculty, doesn't get health insurance, doesn't get, um, you know, a tenure position, doesn't have doesn't job security. Have is no sabbatical, is freelance, gets paid probably in the neighborhood of $4,000 per course that they teach per semester. Um, and they're being, it, it's another example in my book of how um, corporations are screwing their employees. Absolutely. And I think art schools are part of this, and I think it's ugly. I think and it's very ugly, and I think you have to really think to yourself, like, how can you do this? How can you get out of it? And how can you utilize them as a stepping stone into something else? Precisely. Yeah. All right, let's shift gears. Okay. Um, you are starting a new body of work. 
How did you decide to do a new body of work instead of continuing the previous body? How many bodies of work have you had in the la since you've been making art? <laughs> I have a lot of bodies of work. So, I mean, I, you know, I call myself a painter and I definitely make paintings and drawings, but I also make installations, wall drawings, um, animations, um, things like that, that end up being very closely related if you look on my site, but they're different bodies of work, I would say. So if you look on my website, I have that broken down in these kind of six squares yep. of different bodies of work. And so, I mean, I'm not about to change my work. I mean, I don't think I'm going to start painting figures or anything next week. Um, but, you know, I am, everything's left to two different shows. And so I'm just kind of starting fresh again. Uh, I, well, what's different about this forthcoming body of work? What's going to distinguish it? I don't, you know, it's hard to, to answer that until I'm through the body of, of work in a sense. You know, I'm, I'm working on translating my drawings into code or into a language and that I have a whole body of work that I translate drawing into sound and I really want to kind of push that into language and things like that so for me I'm someone also who you know I really want to keep pushing my work and pushing it into different medias and thinking about you know when you're a painter now maybe how does that um, how does that fit into making work where you're surrounded by videos or your YouTube or your iPhone, um, things like that. So I do make animations or other things like that as well, that I feel like ad address that, even though I call them paintings in a sense. Who is New your New York gallery? I just had a show at Lombard Freed, a group exhibition, and so we'll see what happens with them. But my gallery for the past eight years was uh, uh, DK, uh, Priska Yuska. And she's still around. You're that was frozen. the yes. You, you froze at that moment. The internet playing with you. When your tower closes. So she's still around. She is not around. She has closed her gallery. Okay. And so I am moving on into a new gallery. I'm moving up. Pretty does much. that scare you or does it liberate you or it do you liberates me so for me i started at that gallery when i was um i was much younger i didn't have a lot of exhibitions and i did feel in some ways i mean and just to be frank of this that i really wanted to go to a more established gallery but they had done so much for me there was no way out of that relationship in a way you know, I feel, I felt very, so for me, it's great. Um, and I also, you know, in a way it's given me, I can sell my work out of my studio, which I don't think is maybe an answer for me for the long run, but I have to say, I've certainly learned that A, I'm pretty good at it and B, um, it's very nice not to give up 50% of my money. So. True, huh? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> But, so, but, you, but you get something for that. Um, you get, sometimes you get more for it than other times. And so I think it's the question of where I am now. It's like, you know, I have to get a number of things for it. Because there's a lot, a lot of things I can do on my own at this point as well. But I do believe in galleries and I'm, I show in galleries and I'm certainly moving in that direction. I, I don't think... I could be, I could possibly be a free agent. I hear you. What, what, um, how much dialogue would you have with her when the gallery was around in terms of developing work, et cetera? I, I, I want to explore your relationship with galleries. I mean, I had a very um, intense, close relationship with them. So they gave me um, four solo shows in New York over a 10 year period. Um, they sold an enormous amount of my work. They sold my work to MoMA. They set up galleries for me in Europe. Um, they did quite 
a lot for me. And I, the great thing about them that I will say is um, they allowed me to really push my work into animations, into installation. If I showed up and said, I'm going to make an ephemeral wall drawing, they usually supported me. I don't think a lot of galleries would do that. I don't think all galleries would do that. Right. So um, I was quite supported, you know, for a long time in that. Still, I, you know, there's always issues in galleries and there's a commercial aspect to a gallery that, you know, they expect work. They expect a lot of work for art fairs. Um, you know, there's definitely like tricky things, you know, business-wise. I can go in a couple directions here. I want to go to the art fair thing. Would you attend the art fairs? <clears throat> I do attend art fairs. Um, I mean, I think like most artists or probably every, everyone in the art world, I have mixed feelings about art fairs. Yep. Um, but for me, you know, what's great about an art fair, I think for, for an artist, I don't spend a long time, but it's an amazing thing when you can go to the Armory or to Miami and you can see 300 galleries from around the world and look at galleries from Latin America, um, Europe, the Middle East. Um, I mean, I think that's really an interesting thing to be able to do because it's like you just, you don't have access to this all the time unless you're constantly traveling and even then you're missing a lot of the world, right? And so for me, I mean, that's the interesting part is just to see kind of what's out there and who's showing it. Um, 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 we were scheduled to do a webinar together like in July or something and we had to change the date because yeah. I'm such a nice guy. Um, so nice. Yeah, there we go. All right, I got that recorded. Um, what happened? So I was offered a show in Italy very last minute and this is a um new gallery it's in rimini italy on, on the coast of italy <laughs> it's a museum gallery and um they offered me a show they offered to bring my family how did this wait a minute i want to know more about this how did they how did this come up were they looking for you because you're such a dear italian girl or what they are <laughs> working with a trio of German curators um, called La Rete Projects, who <coughs> do something very interesting. They are, one of them's based in Italy, one's based in Germany, one's based in New York, and they are um, curating internationally. And I, one of these curators, um, Julia Draganovic, has worked with me before, and um, I just fit the slot. They were looking for an artist, and she recommended me. I actually happened to have a lot of work in the studio, which was kind of a serendipitous moment. And so I said, yes, I mean, why not? It was a great... What was the time you know, between the ask and the opening? Was how what period of time? Six weeks. Four That's quick. Six. Yeah, it was this, the conversation was started and I actually did not think it was going to happen. I didn't really believe them that it was going to happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then I thought, I'll send the work. Um, and then they actually offered to bring me and my family. So that was kind of the end part of it. Um, very, very last minute and um, a pretty professional gallery, but still last minute. And I think that's how it happens a lot, you know? I think it does. I mean, you know, um, do you think they always do things that last minute or is, is somebody else's show fell through? Do you know? They haven't, they're a new gallery, so they're just starting. <laughs> and so um, I think I'm the third exhibition. So I think they're really starting to plan. And I think the, the Italians are funny. They're just notoriously um, disorganized and funny and hilarious. And I think that's, was part of it. I, I don't think that really would have happened maybe in, in New York or maybe even in, I don't think it would have happened in Germany. I think it was kind of there a little more relaxed on their scheduling. <laughs> and so it kind of happened last minute. But all the work had to be shipped by air then, right? Yeah, I shipped, it's kind of amazing. I shipped all works on paper. I had a whole show on paper. Okay. Sent it to the framers right when it got and it was framed within 24 hours. Well, it was framed there or here? Framed in Italy. And the show's over now? Shows up for three months. Oh, so things sold? 
Uh, things have sold, yeah. And there's been some press, so it's great. So you have to go visit all the homes that your art goes to, right? Isn't that part of the deal? <laughs> I, want, I want tickets for all the homes of where it goes to. A separate trip. Separate trips. <laughs> I have to install it, yeah. So, all right, you have, when you have a family, this is you, your husband and your child? Yes, yeah, so my husband and my child um, came with me. So you're going to ask me about being married to an artist, right? You're, you're prescient. You have it. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. We don't have to go there. We can just talk about your child. I think it's an interesting place to go. So um, you want to go to art motherhood or marriage first? Yes. You got you go. You go? talk. Okay. Either way. Um, my husband is Pablo Helguera. So he also an artist and um, a much more conceptual based artist, performance, um, social practice, um, things like that. So first of all, he's a very, functions in a, in a way, a completely different art world than I function in. Although we cross over a little bit, we have a very different uh, art world. And um, they did come, I have a four year old daughter and um, we consistently bring her with us to shows. So we took her to Italy, we came home, and then my husband was actually in Sight Santa Fe. And then we went to that exhibition. So um, we're try really to sort of integrate our whole life with bringing her um, and bringing each other to shows. So, um, She's a significant part of your art experience? Is she a significant part? What's her name? Um, her name is Estella. And so I don't bring my daughter in a way to the studio because it's just, it's too distracting. Um, but I will say, and I think anyone would say this who's a mother, it has completely, of course, like changed my practice dramatically. And um, an example of that um, is when I had her four years ago, um, I was home for the first time for two months. I was thinking, oh my God, staying home with a newborn, like this is not my style. <laughs> and I really had to think of a way to make my work. And I had wanted to make these animations for years, probably for a decade. And I had only been making still drawings and paintings. And I figured out a way to hire one of my graduate students to come to my house, she taught me animation. Um, I had no intention of showing those animations at all. Um, and now I've shown them all over the National, I showed them at the National Gallery last year, a lot of different places, and it's really opened up a completely different uh, opportunities for me, actually, um, in museums and screening animations and things like that. So that's been a very interesting, you know, change. Um, in a way, right. that was very unexpected. Um, how much do you and Pablo talk about art? I mean, are you discussing ideas? And then, the, you know, the corollary is, how much do, do your ideas affect each other? You know, I feel like we're talking about, like, <laughs> putting our daughter to bed. <laughs> but no, of course, you know, when we talk about art, Art is when um, one of us is stuck on a project. Okay. And so many times I'll be stuck and I'll have to, um, you know, this is after all the boring domestic things that we have to talk about. So I don't want to make it sound so romantic. Um, but, you know, when I'm, for example, I just went up for a public art project um, and I was very stumped on that. So we do really talk about like ideas of how to kind of push one another especially when we have proposals due. Um, I always, uh, we always ask one another and I definitely always ask my husband like, <clears throat> you know, different things on gallery. There's very tricky questions that happen in the art world with galleries, collectors, um, things like that. Like how do you, how do you handle certain situations? I mean, I think that happens to us a lot. You know, we'll get an email that 
is a, in a way maybe a socially tricky situation or a business oriented question coming from a gallery or something like that? How do you handle discounts or two galleries, one a piece? Or, so we always really are sounding boards. And that is, I think, really invaluable. Definitely. Yeah. You want to hear the <laughs> hear the what? <laughs> Should I talk about the challenging parts? <laughs> yeah, probably. Pick, pick the, yeah, pick a prime one. A prime one. Um, I mean, I think we, if you saw our Google calendars, I think that would kind of explain everything that they're, we have absolutely probably insane travel and exhibition schedules. We have two jobs, we have two art careers where we're both showing a lot and we have a small child. So it is really a feat of scheduling intricately every month. Do you like going to each other's openings? I do. I mean, for me, it's interesting for me to go to one of Pablo's openings because you realize in a sense how big the art world is because I feel like, you know, these are not like my people. Right. <laughs> I feel, I'm sure he feels very much the same way about people who deal with my work that are dealing with abstraction or painting and drawing or animation. Um, so of course, you know, we definitely, there's some people that cross over, but it's kind of amazing. It's not, I mean, we are in two different art worlds. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. Um, all right, let's take some questions. I like Nestor's question for a start. Nestor, <laughs> Nestor I'm gonna, wait a minute. Nestor, you can just ask it. Ask it. Um, hold on one second. I got to do some scrolling here. Why isn't my scroller working? Ay, ay, ay. Um, go ahead. N Nestor, did you unmute yourself? Go ahead. Yeah, but I'd have to read the chat to, to see what my question was again. It's the most recent one. It's not too hard. Uh, I have to open the chat. Let's see. You must have the grandparents nearby. I have my mother nearby, um, but we, are you talking about so I can go out to openings? And oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm an artist and, you know, I, I'm a Mr. Mom and my wife works and I, I had a little daughter and it was, I turn around to try to work and then uh, run back and get something out of her mouth, you know? Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> Um, you know, my mother is pretty elderly, um, but I, I do have a babysitter and, um, you know, she's on after school and, you know, still like we, I get one, my one late night, you know, or two late nights, um, a week and we, we pay for it, which is really not that much fun in New York, but <laughs> I mean, I, I do it, I, you know, I try to do it. I will say just on, you know, motherhood in general, um, I, I don't really have that much help. And one thing that I did do that was really helpful for me is I realized I was going to the park and I was having these conversations with people in the park and it was about like when, did, you know, did your kids sleep last night or are these boring? And I realized actually in Brooklyn, there were probably about 20 people around me that had children, that had babies. And on my phone, I realized there were two curators down the street and there were about five other artists within 10 blocks and I put them on quick dial on my phone. And so what I would do is when I went to the park, I would actually you know, I would, I would dial them and say, I'm going to the park. And I've actually gotten into three shows from that. <laughs> so that's kind of an amazing thing. So, you know, the great thing about the art world now is that people have kids. And I think if you find other people with kids and connect with them in the art world, it gives you an excuse as well. Like these are curators that I wouldn't have necessarily, um, you know, been that friendly with but we were in this situation and it was it worked out in a way great you know so it really can you know i mean the, the kids sort of remove the parents of a bullshit factor or you know or, or the the hit the assumed hidden agenda and you know if you can just talk to another person about poop <laughs> um it seems so much more genuine yeah, I mean, you know, it kind of re reorganized my world in a weird way, you know. So, 
<clears throat> Nevertheless, I've also, you know, I don't sugarcoat this. I mean, it is, there's a lot of challenges to having a child and, and making your work. And, you know, I will say that um, <clears throat> on that, I don't talk about this in public this much, but I will. Um, I started a website called Momtra. So you can go to this. It's actually Art Mom Backwards. <laughs> and on that website, there are hundreds of tips from artists who are parents who on how to make your work and be a parent. There's a list of uh, parent-friendly residencies. There's a list of readings on parenthood and art making. And it's interesting, you know, people are really kind of, a lot of people have gone to that web. There's a list of um, 100 successful women artists who have children. So um, I did a lot of research on that. Oh, well, there's a lot of people. There are a lot of people. Mostly females. <laughs> I mean, I did it from a female perspective. So, I mean, yeah. I wanted to find role models for myself that, okay, my life is not going to end when I have a kid. I'm going to keep making my work, right? So H.C. So Westerman had a two-year-old child, and he was t to take care of the kid all day in the studio. <laughs> So he, hand, he, t he stuck each of the kids' hands, two-year-old, in a jar of marshmallow sauce <laughs> <laughs> and handed the kid a feather. <laughs> well, that's an idea. Yeah. That's five that. minutes in my house and my kid would be screaming. You know? <laughs> that's outrageous. All right, Anne, you have a question. Hold on, let me scroll up to Anne. Um, hey, we're moving into the you guys get to ask questions phase. Go ahead, Anne. Ray, hi. Um, I uh, noticed that you had an exhibit at the Wellen in Clinton, New York, and I'm an alumni of oh, that college, actually Kirkland College, which was what absorbed by Hamilton College. And I was excited, and I was wondering if you could tell me how that exhibit happened. Sure. And, so and that is, um, you probably know this because they're very good with their alumni, but yeah. um, Hamilton colleges built that museum. So contemporary art museum. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful museum. And coming off the topic that we were just talking, they're, they're showing career women artists, giving them their first solo exhibitions. Um, this was a curator. Her name is Tracy Adler, who had worked with me. She was a curator for Hunter Galleries in New York and had worked with me for a number of years, putting me in small group shows. Um, when that museum opened, she was appointed the director and curator and, and said, I'm gonna give you your first solo show, uh, solo museum show. Um, they did a wonderful catalog and I showed five years of my work. So that was a really quite a big, you know, quite a big project. You know, and definitely it was my, I've never had a survey like that before. So it was wonderful. I spent a lot of time at Hamilton. I worked with the students and um, I spent a lot of time during installation. I did a really big wall drawing and it was great. So how did you meet Tracy again? I can't remember. Tracy, you know, I, she was the curator at Hunter Gallery here. And actually, you know where, again, it's from the Marie Walsh Art Foundation. She came to Open Studios and saw my work there and that's how the relationship started. Okay. Right. I think this is evidence of how, you know, making good work is a prerequisite, but it frequently isn't sufficient. And so many opportunities are an outgrowth of relationships. And when the relationships begin, you don't know, you know, what, it, how it's going to manifest itself. And you don't even know how these, you know, these relationships that have already served you well are not ended. They, they're ongoing. And, you know, I think the idea is to, you know, you do what you can to reciprocate and you speak well of these people. Um, and, you know, maybe you'll be providing them opportunities in the future, but it, it's definitely relationships that make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I, I say to my graduate students or anyone like that, I think, you know, artists who are alone kind of stop making work. So I think it's like, really finding a community for yourself in some way. I mean, I think that's how your work gets out there. And that's also how you keep making work in general. 
I mean, it really, I think is crucial. And I think you're right. You know, this was, you know, Tracy was a young curator when I met her. She was in a small gallery and we kind of like over years in the art world kind of, you know, grew together. And the timing was just right. She became this director of this museum and I got presented a great opportunity from it. I mean, I think that's frequently the case, those kinds of things. Yeah, happen. definitely. But, you know, it's also you taking responsibility for it and having the epiphany of starting a mom group you know, and, and, and calling people and you're taking responsibility for growing your community. It isn't like you, I mean, to an extent you stepped into an existing one, but really everybody shapes their own. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm naturally social. So I, I think, you know, for some people this is, um, you know, this is harder, but I think there's a lot of ways to do it. I mean, I think there are people who, who blog and do it and connect a way, you know, there's, there's other ways people create things. So I think there's just so many different ways to. Yeah, I agree. Who else has that question? To create your own community. Right. Who else has questions? We're talking about Anne's book. Anne, let's hear about your book for a minute and then we'll, we'll okay. go ahead. Um, so in 1996, I published a book about artists who are mothers. It was a series of interviews. At the time, of course, my son was really little, and it was an issue that Danielle's been talking about. And I still have some copies, and I, it was, I just heard the other week about a woman who was really you know, deeply affected by it. So that was really gratifying. Yeah. I, read your book actually I think it's on my list <laughs> have you strong hearts inspired minds really yeah. oh wow amazing <laughs> you know I mean I you know some of the, the same issues are still there and I think it's evolving into you know a lot of men now are stay-at-home mothers and are dealing with the same same thing you know so but yeah. I think it's also evidence of how small the world is, you know, I mean, how Anne wrote a book a little bit over a decade ago, pushing two, and, um, you know, you have access to it, you know, and I could see a relationship or some connection between the two of you and the book and these common issues, you know, I think it's all um, relevant. Nestor asks an interesting question, does anybody got a book out there for ch teenage children of artist parents? Oh, God. Yeah, exactly. I, <laughs> that's way ahead of me. I'm just not even there yet. Yeah, Nestor, I think you're going to have to write it. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to Sam. Hold on. Sam, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Um, hey there. Uh, so um, I'm an adjunct professor at a university, and um, there, I'm sort of curious, you said how we could possibly use it as a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. And I'm at that point where it's a, it's a wonderful faculty. It's a, it's a great institution in many ways in other ways, not, but I know my future isn't there. And so do you have any suggestions like where to go? <laughs> where are you? I'm in, uh, uh, Montpelier, Vermont. I have two kids, husband, and okay. you know, yeah. All good questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that. Um, I mean, you know, where to go? I mean, that's that's a hard question. But I think the yeah, bottom yeah, yeah. line is, yeah. I I wouldn't get comfortable. You know, I, I think that's what happens to people is people get comfortable and they have a few classes and then five, ten, twenty years passes and then you're in this, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, I would think really in an entrepreneurial way, what can yeah. you do? How can you teach online? I mean, how can you market your own work? And I would really think out of the box. I would really think what can you do to, you know, generate an income that maybe, maybe it's not teaching, but I would not stay comfortable. I would really, I think online teaching and I think anything digital is going crazy. I don't know what you make, but I will tell you right now that that's the only thing that is hiring in higher education is, um, and if you have any skills like that, you're going to be marketable. You know, I also think doing something in a way that, I mean, something like this, 
you know, something that Paul does. Doing something where, you know, you can be a mentor, you can do something online. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, bring artists to, to Vermont. I mean, Vermont, everyone wants to go to Vermont. So it's a beautiful place. I mean, I just curated an exhibition <laughs> with, with 60 artists. We're all academics. I, I teach in the Bronx at CUNY. Yeah. No one comes to the Bronx. It's just like being in Vermont or something. And so I curated a show with 60 artists. And now that it, all, all academics, all painters, and now that's going to travel to seven other art offices in different universities. Wow. And it's kind of connected me to a lot of people. So that doesn't mean I'm making money off of that, but I am going to all these places and doing ex I'm doing talks. Right. And I am making money off of that. Right. So I would think, um, you know, maybe a tenure track job is not, you know, I, I wouldn't think that that's the path that's going to happen because I think, you know, you sounds like you have enough awareness that that's not. Yeah. Going to yeah. No, I, yeah. I think that like screw that anyway. I mean, you have a lot of options to you. You know, I would really think about, you know, look at people. I think you guys had Sharon Butler, right? No. Yeah. Uh, you know, she, uh, no, but she hasn't been on, the, I haven't done a webinar with her. You know, Sharon, I mean, Sharon's someone who was an academic and she was in the middle of nowhere. Um, she's, you know, not, I don't think someone who's naturally social. Right. Um, she started an amazing blog and transformed her life, you know, that people follow. She's a great writer. So I, I don't know what your strengths are. I personally could not blog. I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> but you know you I would I would really think of like how do you kind of um, create something interesting that connect people across the country or something along those lines um, to draw attention I think you know Sharon Loudon's another one you know she's someone who you know functions doing talks all over the place um, so there's there are a lot of ways to do it you know yeah I know, I'm constantly thinking about it. I, I know it's not the end road. The other one who I just met is Adrienne Outlaw in Nashville. Amazing. These are all women who... Um, Adrienne, we did a webinar with in the spring. She is yeah. wonderful. Adrienne is awesome. She's someone, again, who was like in her studio. She felt isolated. She was, you know, living in Nashville. Um, she started an amazing thing called Seed Space that brought in artists from all over the country. It's done very well. There are three examples, actually. Yeah. Um, and there's, a, you know, a lot of different. So I think that's, that would draw attention to you in a way that also then people want to bring you to do talks, you know, or things like that. Yeah. I mean, I have a blog going. It's just a matter of it gaining traction. It's learning that whole side of things. Yeah, but I, I think just yeah. like, I think the real trouble happens is people get comfortable and then they think that this is going to change into a tenure track job. And, and that's not what happens 95, 98% of the time, right? Right. I think you're always alluring somewhere else. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's, I think there are other ways to kind of make money, whether you use your creativity, go into businesses, go into, you know, there's lots of things. And so, um, yeah. I mean, I would meet with someone who knows how to strategize and market themselves and really kind of find five or 10 examples of role models of people who have taken their creativity and marketed it in a certain way to make a sustainable income in different, interesting, different ways. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, screw the teaching, you know, and then you, maybe you teach one or you teach lectures or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I think like out of the box, out of the box, because I think what people have and they think it's one plus one equals two and it is not even when you're in a tenure track deal. Right. Yeah. Things have, go awry a lot. Um, I want to throw you. this out there and because I don't see any reason that client artist works can't become a university and I'm entertaining the notion of having other people teach other courses so that if that was something you wanted to do, Sam or anybody, um, yeah. we could talk about it. Wow, that sounds cool. 
Yeah. I mean, I've got, I mean, there's some people that I have been speaking to that I, there's two courses, other courses that may happen in October. I'm expecting to happen in October. I should get in touch with them. It seems like it'd be time to um, get going. Um, all right. And so, you know, if that's of interest, think about it. Okay. Um, I see a number of people with questions. Elisa, go ahead. Let me, well, maybe if I unmute you, that'll be quicker. Um, go ahead. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I'm curious what you charge for your talks. You said that you didn't get paid, you don't get paid anything really for organizing the show of 60 artists, but you're getting called in to do talks about it and you're making money on that. I'd like you to elaborate if sure. you would. That's a huge range between, and I, I will kind of <clears throat> decipher. If I okay. go to a university where I'm there for four days, five <coughs> days, doing critiques, I'm doing maybe a professional development seminar, um, and I'm doing a visiting artist lecture, that's usually probably about 1500 to $2,000. Um, I do many talks where I trade art, other artists who are teachers um, or academics. We trade talks, many times it's $100. I do it in my studio, um, something like that. The average range, I will say, is between, is probably about $500. And okay. you know, for, for a good one, that would mean you just do a lecture. Sometimes a lecture and some critiques. Mm -hmm. But about $500 is stamp standard if I went somewhere in New York. The other thing that comes into that is um, traveling. Do they pay your travel? Do they pay your food? Right. There's lots of hidden things that you don't think about and you start doing it. And now I ask all those questions, right? The one I ask is, is it going to be recorded? Because I want the recording so I can upload it to YouTube. <laughs> A good idea. You're getting something out of it, right? The, the artist curated, the show I curated in my office, that's for fun for me. And yeah. it turned out that things have come out of it, but that was something that I wanted to bring a lot of artists to the Bronx for my students. And then people just love the idea. You know, I, and it's going around to all these different art offices. Because it's, it's fun, you know, and there's great artists in the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just did a I just did a workshop talk kind of thing at, at Mary Hill Museum on 3D design and they offered me $200 to do it. It was just a couple hours, but they paid my lunch and they paid my travel. So it was right. seems like pretty good, you know, I mean, and it was a, a fun would, event. Yeah, I would think of it this way, like, is it, you know, are you going to get something further from it? Is it a relationship with the museum? Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. all those things get added in when I think about what I'm doing, right? Yeah, yeah. It's an investment. And, and I've done many talks for free, you know, yeah. if I felt like it was the thing to do. Or mm -hmm. if I'm giving to a group of students <clears throat> that, you know, they didn't have money for whatever reason, that's, you know, I do that, definitely. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. VJ, um, go ahead. Thanks, Paul. Sure. Um, I was intrigued by your acceptance of a last minute invitation to show at a new gallery. Um, as a mid career successful artist, you must get a lot of invitations. So, what criteria did you use other than the location, you know, being at the coast on the coast of Italy? Or what do you typically use to assess a gallery? Is it, is it the reputation that the dealers? Is it the, um, group you're showing with? Is it European exposure? How did you go about making that decision? Well, I think there's, a, the, yeah, that's a really good question. And I will say anytime that I have any kind of invitation, you know, I do what many people do is I Google, right? I usually take that a little step further that I look and see who are the artists they have shown. Then I usually Facebook those artists or I reach out to them and I don't, I don't say, the underlying conversation is this, look, do these people pay you? Are they professional? Are they crazy? <laughs> How I do present it is, oh, you know, your galleries reached out to me and I'm really looking forward to doing a project and um, I hope I meet you. If something's awry, that artist usually writes back and says something like, well, you know, you should really watch out. 
or some, or this is awry, or this is, you know, something that's happened. So, I mean, I check, everything goes by reputation, and I will say, like, you know right away if there's something. I think most artists tend to be probably overly afraid and paranoid. I've had certain things happen. Very, very rarely have I had something like, you know, I haven't got paid or something like that. I, I just say, like, if you show for 10, 20 years, that's going to happen to you once or twice. It's part of it, right? Um, but I check out the galleries and I ask collectors and, you know, the, the, the art world's so enmeshed and people are so enmeshed on Facebook. Like, it's, it's not that hard to find out people's reputations anymore. Um, and as for me with the European show, of course, that was a big draw. I, I don't need another show in the U.S. or in New York, but I really was, it was really appealing for me to show in a place that I'd never shown in before. And it definitely factored in. You know, absolutely. So I weigh all those things. Chris but has I, two good questions. I think that was a good answer and a good question from Vijay. Um, Chris, proceed. Oh, hi. hi. Um, well, one question was, uh, what programs do you use to do your animations? And the other one was, do you set your own prices or does the gallery? Uh, okay, so first, I usually use um, Flash. Second, setting the price. I, I do have a precedent for my prices from, from galleries, but I have a little bit of a wiggle room in there that when people come to my studio, I keep that at market price, but I can discount on the invoice as far down as I want, in a way, in the studio. So I have uh, some wiggle room, but I will say, like, that's only because my work has been selling for a while. When I started out, um, in general, the gallery would say, well, what do you, you know, what do you think we put this at 1500? You know, this is like what artists around you of this level would be selling. And I, it would be a little bit of a conversation. They would usually have the upper hand in, but definitely it was a conversation. And I would in general agree, you know, and so that's kind of how things evolved with it. But I definitely, I, yeah, okay. Harley. <laughs> Harley, go ahead. I'm unmuted. Oh. Yep. Yeah, I, uh, you said earlier you had a, a checklist, sort of a, a gallery for their 50% they have to fulfill. I was just wondering what that is and how, if you do negotiate with them, are you saying what do I expect from the gallery when they take that yeah. 50%? <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. Um, and, you know, some, this is what I've learned, um, you know, having galleries. You know, some galleries are really good at getting press for you and getting museum show for you, and, and they cannot sell anything. And then other galleries are great at selling, and they cannot get a review for their lives. Um, so I think it's really like you can't, it's kind of like, you know, when you're in love and like you think the night is coming and he or she is going to be perfect. It's, I think not like that. It's not going to be perfect, right? You're going to need like five galleries. And so you're going to get something from one gallery, something from another gallery. I don't know if you should, <laughs> it's probably isn't good to like relate this to your relationships, but <laughs> You need five relationships. Perfect. Yeah, great. <laughs> like you're not going to get everything from one gallery. And um, what do I expect? I expect sales. I expect press. I expect to be paid within 30 to 90 days, if not absolutely within six months or the relationship is over. Um, you know, I expect exposure, art fairs, things like that. But, you know, sometimes I, like, I have, you know, I have a gallery that now that they sell my work regularly and they don't get other things. And they're amazing for me because they sell my work regularly. So, you know, it's, it doesn't always come in one package. And I actually, I would go as far to say it doesn't ever come in one package. It will never happen, the perfect 
gallery and the people I know who do show in the perfect galleries. I have a good friend who shows at David Zwerner. I know people who show at Gagosian. <laughs> and it's hard to believe, but even they are complaining. <laughs> Plus, um, you know, there are issues when you are a smaller fish in a big, big pond like that. You're competing at a different level and there are other problems and other pressures. So it's a, a process, right? So. Sure, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Um, anybody else? Well, that's interesting. Elise is, Elise is asking about problem, and Sam has another question. I'll get there, Sam. Elise is asking about unsolvable problems. What is it, you know, like, would get you to walk? Not getting paid is one. Anything else? Not getting paid is one, but not getting paid is very tricky because if you do walk, you in general never get paid. <clears throat> so um, that becomes, a, you know, a, a tricky one too. But definitely, yes, not getting paid. I think um, losing art. I mean, this has happened um, to a number of people. And I think in general, maybe not really feeling like the gallery is on a professional level. Not showing good artists, uh, not presenting the work in a professional way. Things like that would get me to walk. All right, let's so have a last question. Was there, is there a follow-up there? Go ahead. Sorry, I had another question uh, about that. So what is your, uh, how do you exit a gallery? Because I'm kind of in a situation like that. <laughs> I need to do something about. I would really, I, I'm going to relate this all to your romantic lives. <laughs> I do that a lot. I feel like it's like dating, you know? They're, I'm just not that into you. Exactly. So me, I don't know where you are in this relationship, whether you've gotten engaged. I don't know if you're married. I don't know if you've had, if you, if you maybe you've had two or three solo shows and maybe you have children, right? It gets harder to get out of, right? So I would say um, it's very similar. It's kind of like, you know, I love you in a lot of ways and you've done a lot of great things for me um, and thank you so much, but I really feel like it's time that I move on into another relationship. And I <clears throat> make sure you have all your work before you begin this conversation because you know what it's like to have to go to your boyfriends or girlfriends and get all your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I would, you know, if you're going to make that decision, you might want to like, you know, have your, your ducks in line and, and then you, you have, and I'm very much for, I think a lot of artists just kind of start, stop showing up, stop, you know, answering emails. I think if someone have, has shown you and given you support in your work, you should show up to their face and say, thank you. It's time for me to move on instead of like two timing them. I think it's really important to do that because what I've noticed is you're never going to separate, you're never going to get away from these people, by the way, because I, you're going to be around in the art world with them forever. That's true. Yeah. So it's really good. Like, you know, you're going to go to a gallery and there's going to be like three ex-boyfriends, but they're going to be like three ex-galleries. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to like be, you know, vocal about it. Yeah. Definitely. Cool. All right, Sam, you got the last question. Um, go ahead, Sam. Yeah. Um, what would you say is your overall goal as an artist? Like you're showing at museums, you're showing at galleries, you have these relationships going, you're making money at your, at your work. Do you ever, would, do you ever sort of um, think about what the overall like, is this just a job? Is this, this is what you do kind of thing? Or is there a sort of a, a deeper kind of pull in you that wants, you know, that you have to do your work because you want to do good work? You know what I, you know what I mean? Like, what's the overall mission? <clears throat> I mean, I think the overall mission and, you know, there's a lot of administration and there's a you know, when artists are showing 10, 20, 30, 40 years, there's a lot of things that happen in your career a lot of ups and downs and a lot of different relationships and a lot of maybe different types of work that you make I mean for me it's make it's about 
really kind of pushing and evolving your work and making good work because when you're, you know, hopefully 80, 90, 100 years old, you know, I want to be able to look back and say to myself, like, I made authentic work, right? It wasn't yeah. just about showing it. It was like, I made authentic, good work, and I really tried my hardest to show it and to communicate right. to the world. You yeah. know? And I think if things do go awry where you're not doing that, and I think that happens for many, many reasons, you know, I think people get stuck and people get busy and people get broke and people get tired and there's a lot of things that happen, you know, when you look at an artist's career. But I think kind of pushing through that and looking back and saying like, you know, you kept picking up that thread to keep working. I yeah. think that's the bottom line. If you start making work that you're not happy with, then, then what? You live a false life in a way. And that I don't think there's anything worse than that for me and being an artist, you know? Right. But like success and failure are so close, can be so close together and it, but at the same time, you just have to keep pushing and probing. And this and is my motto basically is that if you are still making your work, you are winning, wow. <laughs> you know, so that's my, yeah. that's what I say. And after, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, I look back at graduate school, you know, 10 years ago for me, almost none of those people are still making work. And I went to a really great, amazing graduate school. And I think to myself, like, oh, my God, you know, that is amazing. But, you know, after 10, 20 years in the art world, like, so many people I know are just not making their work. So, yeah. you know, I would really say, like, well, you know, you're winning if you're making your work, you know, whether, like, whatever's happened to you in your life. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's when you win. You know, I, I'm really, you know, it's interesting. Like, I used to be really impressed by people who got a lot of attention after graduate school. Right. And now I'm very, like, impressed with people. My neighbor here is 85 years old, and she comes in every day and makes her work. And she's not making, like, tiny little flowers. She's making, like, big, heavy, intense work. Wow, that's inspiring. I think, inspiring. I think that's like winning. You yeah. Know? Sure. yeah. That's what, yeah. you know, you want to do. You want to like, no matter what's going on, like you want to keep going and so yeah. figure out how to sustain yourself to do that. I right. think that's success, you know. Yeah. Thank you. That was a great last question and a great way to wrap it up. And clearly, Danielle, you are winning. And, you know, it's clear from listening to this hour. I'll send you the recording so you can be impressed with yourself. Um, <laughs> you know, but I mean, I think you're doing, you, you are pulling off what it is you seek to accomplish. You are winning. And, you know, it's a combination of having, I think, a good attitude and talent and, you know, presence and bringing it together and accomplishing that. I'm really, let me unmute everybody. I'm really glad you were here with us tonight. And I think you've contributed to us and to the art world too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Danielle's fan club is going away. Danielle, thanks so much. Thank you.